On this day the Virgin comes to the cave to give birth to God, the Word ineffably, who was before all the ages. Dance for joy, O earth, on hearing the gladsome tidings. With the angels and the shepherds now glorify Him, who is willing to be looked on as a young child who before the ages is gone. Let us pray to the Lord. What a mercy. We give thanks to you, Lord our God, who has raised us up from our beds and has put into our mouths a word of praise that we may worship and call upon your holy name. And we entreat you by your mercies, which you have exercised always in our life. Send down now also your aid upon those who stand before the face of your holy glory and await the rich mercy which is from you. And grant that they may always with fear and love adore you, praise you, hymn you, and worship your inexpressible goodness. For unto you are due all glory, honor, and worship to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. So last month uh, in our sessions, again, we're talking about the Feast of Christ. We focused on the Nativity, the birth of Christ. And uh, this, of course, is pertinent because that season, we're in that season now. Uh, we'll be celebrating that feast in just over three weeks. So, uh, actually, three weeks from tomorrow, I believe, right? Yeah, three weeks from tomorrow. So we're about halfway through the Christmas, uh, the preparation season for Christmas. This week, we're going to move on to the next feast in line, which is the presentation of the Lord. Uh, it's celebrated on February second. So this in the Bible takes place only forty days after the birth of Christ. Um, and so, historically speaking, in the life of Christ, it's kind of the next step in the process. Uh, so we'll talk today about kind of the main characters, why uh, Christ undergoes this ceremony, um, what its impacts are, and some of the themes of the gospel passage for the day. Um, and this passage comes from St. Luke, uh, chapter 2. So remember, this is 40 days after the uh, birth of Christ. Now, this is, this is the passage I'm going to read really quickly from Luke 2 uh, that is about this feast. It says, Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So after the days of purification, and those in the ancient law of Israel, uh, when a woman gave birth to a child, there was a period of purification, uh, which was 40 days long. Of course, we see kind of the same concept in our church um, with the 40 days, uh, the, the service of the 40-day blessing. It's not so much a purification as if the, a woman had done something impure by giving birth to a child. It's simply to bless her so that she can begin once again uh, participating in the life of the church. Again, not because she's barred from the life of the church because of anything that she has done as a woman by giving birth, simply because uh, her body, when a woman gives birth, is in need of healing. Um, even uh, modern-day doctors, when a woman gives birth, that they will tell her to stay home and take it easy for six weeks which is 42 days, which is pretty much the same exact thing. Uh, and so the 40-day period nowadays in our church is, is for, the, it's for the woman, it's for the mother, so that she can rest and heal. And then uh, she doesn't have to feel obligated to come and travel to church um, and to, uh, to stress herself out and wear herself out in that way so she can just heal and, 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 and get healthy. So, but in ancient Israel, it was a rite of purification. 
uh, they were very conscious of things that made them impure. And there were lots of things that made people impure in ancient Israel. Touching a dead body made you impure. There's all kinds of stuff that made you impure. Um, if we had another couple weeks, we could look at Leviticus and the hundreds of laws that there were for the ancient Israelites to, to heal, to uh, follow. Especially for the firstborn son, there was a special service that was done, um, which was the presentation. And this passage of Luke quotes uh, Genesis, uh, no, excuse me, Exodus. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And God in Exodus tells Moses, as he's giving them the law, every uh, firstborn child of Israel, even animals, belongs to me. This is what God tells him. So, in other words, the, son, the firstborn sons and the firstborn animals belong to God. So they were always brought to the temple to present them, and they were redeemed back to the family. So this is what the Virgin Mary and Joseph are doing. They're following this rite and these laws um, that were given in the ancient days to Moses. Now the question we can ask is why? Uh, now we as Christians, have reading the scriptures, we know that Christ is not a, Jesus is not an ordinary baby. You know, his mother is not a normal, you know, ordinary mother. Her pregnancy was not a normal pregnancy. So this concept of purification of Jesus and the Virgin Mary needing to be purified, they really don't apply in this case. You know, Jesus was not conceived. Um, uh, Jesus was not conceived in the normal physical way between a man and a woman, which was where the impurity came from. Um, and Jesus himself is God. If we think about it, he's the lawmaker. He's the one who made the law. He's the one who gave the law to Moses. So it's kind of interesting when you think about now, the person who made the law who gave the law, who is supreme, power, supremely powerful, and you would think above the law, he subjects himself to the law as a baby. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why. So the first one that we wanna talk, I want to talk about today is Christ in the presentation shows that there's no doubt about the reality of the Incarnation. By him, first of all, there's another minor feast on January 1st, which is the same day, same day, same basil, which is the circumcision of Christ. This takes place eight days after his birth. And again, this was another rite of the ancient Israel, that all the male children on the eighth day were circumcised according to the ancient law given to Abraham way back when. So first he goes through the circumcision, then he goes through the presentation. And he does this to show that he is really a child. He's really born as a baby. There's nothing fake or imaginary about him being born. And St. Andrew of Crete, uh, who wrote a lot of the Lenten hymns, uh, he writes about this. He says he proves that because he received circumcision and was carried by Simeon, Simeon was the old man in the temple who receives Christ at his presentation, um, that his theophany, meaning his appearance, the appearance of God among men, was not in fancy or imagination, but that it was true, that it was a real thing that happened, and that Christ was born as a real baby, as a real child. There's a hymn from the feast which says, The ancient of days, talking about God, for my sake becomes a child. God, the most pure, receives purification, that he may confirm the reality of the human flesh which he took from the virgin. Again, he's not in need of being purified. There's nothing impure about baby Jesus, okay? But he does it to show that his incarnation was a real event. It was a real thing. And Simeon, of course, uh, holds him. Holds him as a baby. You know, it's not like Jesus is a ghost. And, and you know, these things kind of sound silly when we talk about them. But there were many heresies that arose in the early church over how Jesus could be God and man at the same time. And they had all kinds of weird ideas about it. And so this feast day is kind of a response to that, like, no, this is a real thing that happened. Jesus is really a child. He's really a human being. So Simeon holds him in his arms and says, my eyes have seen your salvation. You know? So he bears witness that this is a reality. The second reason why Christ goes through this rite of purification, this, this rite of being presented, is to restore humanity's obedience. In, the, in our first session, we talked a lot about Adam and Eve. And how God gave them everything in paradise, and he gave them one rule to follow. One rule. And they couldn't do it. They broke the rule. 
and they were cast out of paradise. And so humanity became very disobedient. You know, from their very beginnings, humanity has always been struggling with this obedience to God concept. And we see it throughout the Old Testament. This is really, I had at seminary, someone explained the Old Testament to me this way. God gives the Israelites rules, they break them, and bad things happen to the Israelites, and then God, they turn, or, turn it around, and God comes and restores the relationship. So that's basically the whole Old Testament, is Israel breaking God's rules. Uh, I mean, it, obviously, we're, I'm paraphrasing very liberally here, but a lot of it is them breaking the rules that God has set for them, suffering in some way, and then turning back to God. And then God restores the relationship between them. In this way, in this feast day, Christ does this, a similar thing. Not by simply punishing humanity with, with pain and death and all these horrible things that the Jews go through in the Old Testament, but by himself becoming a man and showing by example how to be obedient to the will of God. If I'll remind you also of Christ's sermon on the mount, Matthew chapter 5, 17. He says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I came not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. In another part of the gospel, he says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And so the, the, law, uh, the law is part of that. And so Christ has no interest in overstepping the law or kind of just saying, I'm God, I'm going to do what I want. He's, one of his purposes is to show us how to live, how to be obedient to God's will. And so by doing this, by going through this feast and going through this presentation, he does that for us. He's obedient to his own law to show us how to be obedient to his law. Uh, there's a couple of great quotes here from St. Gregory, Palamas, that I'd like to share with you. St. Gregory says, Notice that the creator and lord of the law is completely obedient to the law. What does he achieve by this? He makes our nature obedient in all things to the Father. He completely heals us of, its, of our disobedience and transforms our curse into a blessing. So not only is he showing us the way, it's not like just a simple, what would Jesus do, bracelet kind of thing. It's a matter of uh, also our healing. Because a disobedience to God, sinfulness, is a, is a sickness. It's a, it's a brokenness. And so by restoring our obedience to God the Father, uh, he heals us and transforms our curse into a blessing. So that's St. Saint Gregory. The Metropolitan Hierotheos again connects this back to Adam. Uh, Metropolitan Hierotheos is a modern day theologian from Greece. And he says this obedience had the meaning, meaning of obedience to the law of God, but also of obedience to, of the new Adam, in contrast to the disobedience of old Adam. Remember, when we talked about the incarnation, we talked about Christ being the new Adam, how Adam had fallen and was broken and was cast out of paradise. And Christ in his coming becomes the new Adam. He takes his place so that he can fulfill all the things that Adam failed in and so that he can restore humanity. And so Christ, by being the new Adam, shows that he is obedient in all things uh, where Adam was disobedient. And Metropolitan Eurotheos continues. He says, if the disobedience of the first Adam resulted in the fall and corruption, the obedience of the new Adam, Christ, brought disobedient human nature back to God and cured man of the responsibility for the disobedience. So Christ in everything, and you'll see this, this is a theme throughout the life of Christ, that he is obedient to the will of the Father. The most dramatic instance, of course, is right before his crucifixion. He's in the garden, and he's praying, Father, if this cup can pass from me, please, let this cup pass. Not my will, though, but yours. And even so even in this having to go through this horrible experience of the crucifixion, he is obedient to God the Father. And it's kind of convicting to us, you know? It's like, how many times do we struggle in our lives to do the most simple of God's, the things that God asks of us? Myself included. And it's like when we think about Christ and what he suffered um, to fulfill his Father's will, it's like we really have no excuse. And he, being sinless, having no reason to go through that, being completely innocent, he does it anyway, simply to be obedient to the will of God. So again, he's showing us the way and he's, um, he's restoring our obedience. The last one is for purification. Uh, remember again, this whole rite of the presentation of the temple is a rite of purification. Uh, I'm going to connect this though to an Old Testament story. 
which is from Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, if you guys were here for my liturgy talks, I talk about this a few times. Um, it's, Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet. And so he has a vision of God in the temple. He sees the glory of God in the temple. And his glory is filling the entire temple. It says the fringe of his garment is literally covering the entire temple. This is how expansive the glory of God is in, that Isaiah is seeing. And he sees a vision of angels flying around the throne of God, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And Isaiah, seeing this vision, he feels in a very acute way his own sinfulness, his own unworthiness. You know, it's like when you are, are a witness to something unbelievable, or to, when you meet a person that really impresses you, that really um, humbles you with how what a good person they are. It's like you feel your own unworthiness most in those moments. And so Isaiah, seeing this one amazing sight, he realizes his own unworthiness and he cries out, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So in other words, he's saying, I'm not worthy to see what I just saw. He says, I'm ruined. Woe to me, he says, I am ruined. In that moment, though, one of the angels from the inside the altar flies to Isaiah, holding in his hands tongs and a burning coal from the altar. And the angel touches Isaiah's lips and says, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt shall be taken away and your sins shall be purged. And in that moment, God then speaks to Isaiah and says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. So in that moment, Isaiah receives the burning coal. And, uh, and from going to feeling complete unworthiness before God, I, God calls him into his service. And he's purified through the coal. In the same way, humanity is purified by receiving the Christ child in the, in the presentation of the Lord, in the feast of the presentation. So... In one of the hymns it says, Isaiah was cleansed by receiving the coal from the seraphim. Now this is from the perspective of Simeon, the old man. He says, you fill me with light as you entrust me with your hands as with tongues, him whom you hold. So now think of Simeon, the old man, as a representation of all humankind. And instead of receiving a coal from the altar, who is he receiving? Christ himself. He's receiving the Christ child, the God-man, in his arms. And he feels again his unworthiness, but also that he is being purified. And so Simeon, who is a representative for all of humanity, is being purified and we are being purified now in our connection with Christ. And so this is very symbolic uh, of this feast day. Or this feast day is very symbolic of that. Um, does anybody have the time? I don't want to go too late because I know we have the assembly to do. 10 to 12? Okay, good. Uh, so those are kind of the general reasons why uh, this feast day took place, why this hap event happened. A, a couple of interesting talking points that I was over, going over when I was present, preparing my presentation is one of the things is Christ is brought to Jerusalem, right? This bustling city, the capital of the Jewish nation. It's a major city of the Roman Empire. There's Romans there. There's Jews there. There's lots of people there, right? And so Joseph and Mary come there with Jesus, and nobody recognizes him. Nobody knows who he is, right? He's just this little baby. They're just this family going to the temple, right, to do this presentation service. Except for two people. Simeon, the old man, the old priest who receives Christ, and the prophetess Anna, who sees the child and proclaims that he is the Messiah to the people that were around him. So you ask yourself, like, how does that happen, right? You're the God-man, right? Imagine, like, if, I don't know, someone really famous walked into the church. We all would know who he was. Or at least I would say the vast majority of us would. Now, God himself walks into the temple, and nobody knows who he is. Uh, you know, we think about the Christmas feast, which we talked about last month. It's almost like there's, a, like, a, like an almost like a secretive element to it. You know, it's not a public event. God specifically chooses certain people to witness the birth. Here now, though, Christ is brought into public, and yet nobody knows him. And in Christmas, think about this. People who recognize him are Gentiles. They're not even Jews. Their prophecies have nothing to do about Christ. 
but they follow the star and they're obedient and God enlightens them. So now it's like amazing. He goes into the temple of his own people, the temple that was built for him, and nobody knows who he is. Um, so this just kind of uh, hits on the topic of what I like to, what I've found in the research called the remnant. And the remnant, what I mean by that is that throughout the scriptures, there's always a faithful few who recognized God in their life and honor him and provide pure and perfect worship of him. What do I mean by that? Think about the world, the story of Noah. We all know Noah's Ark, right? So, in the, so now God has created the world. There's all these people living in the world. And how many faithful people does he find in the world? One family, Noah, Noah's family, that's it. And everyone else is drowns in the flood. Uh, and also there's the story of Elijah. In the time of Elijah, there were only 7,000 faithful left. The Jews were taken captive to Babylon. Think about the story of the three youths in the fire and Daniel and how out of all the Jews living in Babylon, there were maybe four or five truly faithful people left that would not worship the, the idol that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had built. Uh, and then also the, when they leave to, uh, Babylon to go back to Jerusalem, there's only a few that return. And so these few people keep the faith going. They pass down the faith to the next generation. This is the remnant. And in this story, the remnant is John the Baptist, who realizes Christ, which we'll talk about next month, who knows Christ and knows who he is, Simeon and Anna. They're the only ones who know who Christ is and recognize him in their life. Think about that. Out of all the world, there were these few people that knew who Christ was. And they are the ones that show us perfect worship of him. Uh, there's another hymn from the feast. It says, for even granting that some of them proved insolent and disobedient with minds void of understanding, yet there is a remnant that is saved and admitted to glory through Christ. And so this feast recognizes that, that Christ will not be universally accepted, that it's up to us to either accept him or reject him in our lives. Think again to the Christmas feast, right? The wise men come to Jerusalem and the, they talk to the Jewish leaders and say, your king has been, your king's star has appeared in the east. Okay, what can you tell us about him? And they say, oh, he's going to be born here and here. They don't even go. Their king is being born, and they don't even go. And so they reject Christ in their hearts. And we see that throughout his life, that he's constantly, Christ is constantly being antagonized and antagonizing the Pharisees. Uh, and so this feast then is a calling to be part of the remnant. It's saying, be like uh, Simeon, be like Anna, who recognize Christ, who know who he is, and honor him in our souls. There's a great book uh, called The Year of Grace of the Lord by a monk named Moses. And he says, let us go to meet Christ and receive him. Adorn your bridal chamber. Welcome Christ the King. Salute Mary, the heavenly gate. These texts from the feast of the presentation can be applied to our own souls also. Each soul also ought to be a temple to God. I'll say that again. Each soul ought to be a temple to God. Just as Christ was brought into the temple, we are to make our souls into a temple for Christ to enter. And each one of us should, like Simeon, take the child into his arms and say to the Father, My eyes have seen your salvation. So this feast is a calling and an invitation to enter into that relationship with Christ, to have him come into the temple of our hearts. <clears throat> And those who can see God as we see through Simeon and Anna are those who are dedicated to him, those who uh, are pure, and those who are obedient to the will of God. And that's who Simeon and Anna are. Anna was a widow, and she spent uh, many years living in the temple doing nothing but serving God and doing his will. And that's why even though she was a widow, she's able to witness uh, Christ when he enters into the temple. St. Gregory talks about her, St. Gregory Palamas says, she spent her days and nights in vigils, in fasting, prayers, and hymns, and her life was blameless. So that's why she recognized the Lord, who, who, whom she served by her actions when he came. In other words, if we serve Christ in our life, when he comes to us, we will know who he is. We will recognize him and glorify him. Just like the prophet said. Uh, I'm not sure how much time we have left. <laughs> Five minutes? Okay, good. I'll keep going then. As long as you tell me I got more time, I'm just going to keep going. Because I love talking about this stuff. Okay. 
the, in the gospel passage, Luke 2.34, it says, the, now this is Simeon talking to the Virgin Mary. He says, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. It's a very like veiled comment, right? Like, oh, your child is destined for the rise and fall of many in Israel. The poor Virgin Mary, she's like a 16-year-old you know, mother. She's like a young mother with this new baby. Uh, she had no expectations to be a mother in her life. And now this, this old priest who has received her child into the temple tells her, your son will be the fall and rising of many in Israel. Imagine the Virgin Mary listening to this, how confused she must have been. But it's very indicative of what the gospel teaches about who Christ is. All of humanity will at some point or another come face to face with Christ. This is something that I believe, whether it's overtly or whether it's um, a little more subtle. Uh, Christ, uh, humanity will be called to meet Christ. And we see in different passages that there will be some, as we said earlier, who accept and some who deny him. A great example of that is Matthew chapter 25. Uh, the passage where Christ talks about the sheep and the goats, right? The, the obedient and good sh servant's sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And the sheep are brought into the kingdom and the goats are locked out because they reject Christ in their service to their fellow human beings. That's Matthew 25. In John chapter 5, Christ now is speaking about death and resurrection. And he talks about how all will be raised at the, last, at the last day. All will be raised from the dead. He says those who have done good will be resurrected to life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. St. Gregory of Nyssa, who is another Cappadocian father, he's brothers with St. Basil the Great, I believe. I'll have to double check that again. Um, he says, he is called the salvation that is prepared before the face of all people. He's talking about Christ. So he says Christ is the salvation, but he's likewise the fall of many. He says, how is this possible? He says the divine wish is that salvation and sanctification of each person. So God wants all of us to be saved. He wants to give every one of us paradise. But their fall or resurrection is within the will of each person, both of them that believe and disbelieve. So our salvation then depends on us how our life is lived in either accordance or disobedience to God. St. John Chrysostom has a quote here. He says, whose fall? Who's going to fall on, behalf, on, on account of Christ? He says, without doubt, doubt, those who do not believe and those that place the innocent upon the cross. So there he places specific blame on those who crucified him. He says, those who do not believe will fall. For whose resurrection? Those who give thanks and those who turn to him with a grateful heart. And so uh, the feast is a reminder then through the words of Simeon that one day there's going to be a judgment. You know, Christ is very clear about that. He doesn't mince his words when he talks about the last times, that there will be a judgment and a separation. And, uh, and this, is a, this feast is a reminder of that, that Christ will be the rise and fall of many. The last note, I'm just going to touch on it. I know we don't have a lot of time. Uh, Simeon, in his monologue, he says, Lord, let your servant depart in peace. Simeon was very old when Christ was presented in the temple. And when he sees Christ, because God had promised him, you will see the salvation of Israel. So Simeon receives the Christ and he says, Lord, now let me depart in peace. Let your servant depart. And basically what this teaches us about Christ, about receiving Christ into our lives, is that with Christ, there is no fear of death. With Christ, there is no... Uh, um, there's no anxiety over having to die. You know, our greatest enemy, which was death, has been completely disarmed. The sting has been taken away from death through Christ. And it's a, so it's a, for, final foreshad it's a foreshadowing of the final triumph of the resurrection. So the comfort with which Simeon says, Lord, take me to this next life, is already laying the groundwork for the same things that we will see in the resurrection. For example... There's a hymn that's, that is quoting Simeon who says, I'm going now to Hades to preach the good news to Adam and Eve. Uh, and so it's the same thing that we see in, in Basca where Christ is descending into Hades and the hymns talk about him searching and the fathers talk about him searching for Adam, looking for him to raise him up from the, from the dead into paradise. And so this is kind of a foreshadowing of that. Lord, let your servant depart in peace. 
So as Christians, there's nothing to be afraid of. St. Porfirios talks about whose feast day was yesterday. He talks about death as walking through one door from one room into the next. And that is a reflection of what we believe in our faith. Unfortunately, I don't think we have any time for questions because we have a general assembly and I don't want to get in trouble for keeping you all here and not at the assembly. So I'm going to let you go. I'll go. Uh, we'll meet again next month, I believe on the 7th of January, if I'm not mistaken. So may God bless all of you. Thank you. I'm sorry we didn't have the video today, but next month I'll, I won't forget the cable. So God bless. In the presbyters I keep me ton theotokon Que prostasies a metatheton elpidan Ta fos que necrosis fui que kratisen Os gar zoiz mitera prostin zoin metes disen o mitrani kisas ai parthenou o.